Hello, huddlers. As you well know, the pressure to optimize your ad spending has never been greater. Make more with less is a dominant refrain among CFOs, and it's almost to the point in which CMOs are being asked to make more with nothing. We thought this was the moment to bring in two digital media experts to focus on optimization. We'll start with one-on-ones with each and then bring them together to answer more questions of my questions and your questions. So first up, Josh Mushkin, VP of Sales and Marketing at Web Mechanics. With 12 years in B2B marketing, Josh has advised hundreds of marketing leaders from startups to Fortune 500s. He's also a husband, father, likes to run a lot. Currently, he's working on breaking his personal record of solving a Rubik's Cube in less than 38 seconds, and we're going to hold him to that. Good. Bring it. We're going to have that contest later, maybe after the moment. Okay. So welcome, Josh. How are you and where are you this fine day? Uh, I'm great. I'm calling in from just outside of Baltimore. All righty. Love Baltimore. So cool. Okay. You mentioned in a prep call that you know some pretty big macro issues are negatively affecting digital media performance. Can you walk us through those um, real quick? Sure. The biggest one we've seen over the last, what's coming up on four or five years now is right before COVID, all the major ad platforms, mainly Google, Meta, and uh, to an extent LinkedIn, they all lost significant privacy lawsuits to the tune of several billion dollars. And they lost them because it became too easy to target a very, very narrow subset of people. Uh, Males, 35, who like football, have one dog, two kids, and live in the zip code. Like People didn't like that. And so that's why they were losing. And the reaction is twofold. One, they make 90% of all their money from ads, right? So they have to keep that but they don't want to get sued again. So they have started to make targeting significantly more vague and more difficult to get to. And the way that you see this coming true is people are saying, hey, my search ads don't work anymore like they did in 2018 or 2019. We we have to go find a new platform. We haven't changed the targeting. We haven't changed the keywords, you know, as an example. And if you use Google as an example by themselves, they used to have a way to target exactly a phrase, an exact match keyword. You have to type these three words in in this order and this spelling. And now they're like, well, if they kind of meant that or they spelled it wrong or it's pretty related, like we'll serve an ad to them too. Facebook and others have their own version of this. So the the targeting that used to be very cute is becoming much more broad and it's putting a lot more emphasis on things like data and creative to make the difference instead. Yeah, and and so, I mean, the whole magic of Google was targeting, right? I mean, that was why and search engine... (laughs) SEM used to be the most reliable and it's like you keep spending on SEM until you can't spend another dollar cost effectively. Right. Right. So I'm imagining two things. One, either spending has gone down or clever folks have figured out how to sort of workarounds, you know, and whether it's, and so how should marketers be rethinking their targeting and media buys? There is a significant emphasis now more so than ever on really the data part, the data, meaning like what events are you telling Google to go get you more of? Historically, people would say, hey, someone filled out my demo form. Please go find more people to fill out my demo form. And to an extent, that's largely still true. But there is uh, added importance to say, hey, if you have a campaign on Google, for example, that you want people to fill out a demo form, it should only be looking at people that have filled out a demo form before, not people that have filled out ebooks and white papers and webinars. And similar, if you're doing content marketing, it should be targeting only events that are people downloading white papers, ebooks, and webinars, kind of matching the event to the intention of the campaign. And more importantly, is better defining what those events are, adding layers of qualification, adding things that maybe used to be available to you and targeting, but are not anymore, but that you can ask on the form or through the user's experience, what industry you're in, what, how much revenue do you have, regular business qualifiers, and making it so that the data you're asking Google and Meta to go find more people for you, it's very acutely targeted to a, a smaller group than it previously was. And this is sort of all in this bucket of it's using your first party data, right? Right. To um, to sort of help Google help you. Mm-hmm. So, but I want to I want to make sure that I understand this because the big challenge for folks on all of this is downstream. You know, we what are we optimizing for, right? In that. So it you you know demos is a great example. We're optimizing for folks who who fill out a de- you know a request a demo. What and that that seems like a, a good thing. And so go find those people, 
that look like this person, right? But what else can you do at that point? Because we know that, but I, I guess I'm trying to sort of get at this sort of this optimization challenge that you must face all the time with your customers, which is, I got one thing, I got a form fill here, I could optimize for that, but those people don't close. So mm -hmm. what, how, how is that um, changing, evolving, getting better? So when someone gets on the phone with a salesperson, that person more often than not is asking a standard list of qualification questions. Think Bant, what have you. And every business has several things that really make someone qualified, but there's usually one thing that is the most binary. We can work with you. We can't work with you. And for some people, that's a particular tech stack. For some people, it's a revenue size or, or a geography. And it's usually the first thing that salesperson will ask to qualify and say, should I continue the rest of this call or should I not? One of the things to do is to take that question and functionally put it on either the form or the page experience before they get the sales and ask it there. Because you can be as dramatic as say, if they answer that question wrong, don't do anything. Just give them a big page that says, we cannot help you. Please go somewhere else. Um, <clears throat> or you can give them a, a self-serve model. But the Google doesn't know how people are answering those questions on the phone after they've submitted it. So in order to give that information, you have to say, hey, this user filled out my form. And they answered correctly that they have a tech stack we can work with. Now go find more people with that combination of data points more likely to have. So it's it's finding that one really key question that is as yes or no as it can be, pulling it forward and using that as a part of a filter to say they filled out this form and they meet this criteria. That is now the data point we're going after versus everyone who fills out the form where only 50% of them will answer the sales call correctly. I think I got it. And I, I want to make sure, given all the privacy issues and the difficulty in targeting today, is there anything else in terms of steps that, in general, that the CMO should know about to be able to ask the right questions of their digital buying team uh, in terms of other things that they can do to sort of help make their targeting more effective? It's, I think it's going to be a little less of what they're asking of the team. It, it really forces the sales leaders to integrate more with marketing to say, these are the types of people we want. Here's how we can extract that information from them on the site. Privacy, in many cases, is taken care of by what the platform allows you to do and not. Right. You know, when you're sharing this data with them, you're not giving them that it's John Doe, they live at this address, whatever. It's this anonymous user ID completed this anonymous user action. And it's really using things like uh, your own intuition and knowledge of what makes a good lead and then technology like Tag Manager to say, if this and that, then send data back. So if anything, CMOs need to make sure that their marketing teams are really well aware of what questions sales is asking, which ones are easy to pull forward, which ones are very binary qualifications so that they're matching the Q and the SQL that their sales team would be really happy with, but the Q and the MQL that they're more often than not responsible for driving. Got it, I think. Okay, so let's make this real. Give us an example of what this looks like in action. Maybe a yep. case history. Yep. So uh, we have a client, they previously were called Widen, they're now called Acquia, they were bought and merged together. Um, they had qualifications by industry. It was a combination of uh, both industry and technology that they would use. And there were certain combinations they would happily work with and certain combinations that they could do nothing with. They were in a position where the budget that they got awarded, um, theirs were awarded quarterly when we were working with them. It was actually less than the previous quarter, but as, you know, as things are, their lead goals were higher, uh, such as life. And they had to do effectively more with less, but it was more about an SQL number than it was leads. And so what we had to do was basically make sure that the binary things they had to ask were available on the form of our landing pages. And we wrote a bunch of effectively if-then statements. If this combination, send data to Google. If this combination, do nothing. Never tell Google about those people. And through that, they went from about a $3,000 cost per qualified lead to about a $300 cost per qualified lead, mainly because we just took Google's eyes and they were looking over here, people that were likely felt the form regardless quality and the data helped shift them to the other. So they were in a situation where the budget didn't change and went down actually about 5% and their total number of qualified leads went up about 60 or 70% with that one main change. Certainly you're day-to-day -day activities, help the uh, ad testing, what have you. But that was really the core difference between those two data sets. Wow. So just by feeding back more precise information to Google, I mean, it sounds like a 5X or more uh, improvement in optimization of, of that. And, and in theory, what that means is you have 
it, you may not have as many leads. Well, actually, because the budget, it costs so much less, you have more leads, but the quality of those uh, captured leads are better. Yeah. It's right. the shift of, hey, if we used to get 100 and we were happy if 30 of them were good, now we're getting maybe 90, but 60 of them are good. So we're just getting better quality, which should, in theory, make everybody happy uh, because it, it you're not sorting through and having to get rid of as many as you, as you might have. Yeah, the so, sales team doesn't shake its fist at marketing yes, too exactly. often anymore. Marketing! Um, so what we're talking about here is what we call better demand capture. And we sort of distinguish, and we talk about this a lot in huddles where, you know, there's demand creation, which is the 95% of the people who are probably not in the market today, but we could do things that would help them uh, think about us when they are in the market. And then there's a capture. And what this all sounds like is you are getting the folks that are in the market for your product right now, that making it easy for them to, sort of engage with you and enable them through the purchase process. Is that sort of a fair characterization of what we're, we've been talking about so far? Yeah, yeah, I would say so. Okay, all right. Well, with that, it is time to bring on Mike. <laughs> Thanks, Josh, but we'll be back. But let's spend some time with Mike Ulansky. As Thunder Tech's Performance Marketing Manager, Mike makes sure their clients and content are optimized for top search engines to get more traffic to their sites. Mike isn't afraid to tell you something isn't working because odds are he knows how to fix it. In his time off, Mike likes to bike, golf, and cook. Hey, Mike, welcome. And how are you and where are you this fine day? I am doing very well coming to you live from surprisingly sunny Cleveland, Ohio. And our office is actually in an old torpedo warehouse. So if you hear some dinging, that is our old vents. It just started after we joined this call. Not a problem. An old torpedo warehouse. That is, uh, that's special. It's interesting. Uh, yeah, I bet. Uh, when they say bombs away, you're getting, uh, anyway. All right, let's dive in, starting with, let's just start with a mini case history. Let's get to one of your B2B clients and set the stage with their marketing and their media challenges. Yeah, absolutely. So we work with one of the largest chemical distributors in the United States. They have, I'd say, thousands of different products in tens, twenties, different verticals, right? So very wide product offering, a lot of nuances to all of their products because they are specialty chemicals, right? What we found is that your average chemist or your average procurement specialist isn't going on to Google and typing in industrial lubricants for XYZ application, right? So the traditional digital methods of reaching these target customers was a little bit of a mystery to the organization. So as far as their challenges, right, it is how do we reach this customer who is not in a place that your average digital means would reach this customer? How do we know that our advertising is effective? How do we know that we're reaching the right people, right? You can set up a campaign targeting some audience that may seem very, very much related to the person that you're going after, right? If I go on to one of our platforms and I find an audience that is someone in the chemical industry, right? 80% of that audience could be a customer service representative, or it could be a sales person who isn't the end user, the end buyer of our product. So there is a lot of unknowns in this particular client's uh, landscape, and it is very, very difficult to get to that specific niche person that we want to reach, right? It's finding a needle in a very, very large haystack. And so talk a little bit about the process that you went through and how, how you got to um, these hard to reach people. Yeah, absolutely. So given the situation with the, let's call it non-standard way of reaching these people, right? They're not on Google. They're not looking for education because they are already leaders in our field. We looked to LinkedIn and taking a very, very targeted account-based marketing approach with LinkedIn. When it comes to B2B advertising, I often recommend LinkedIn the most to the many clients that we work with. 
one for its effectiveness of reaching B2B professionals. But for me, I think more importantly is the data that I get back from a LinkedIn campaign. So you can set up a LinkedIn campaign targeting specific industries, targeting specific job titles, targeting a list of 250 companies that are in your industry. And while that is all good and well, top level, what I really like to see is who and where and why are those people clicking and engaging with our ads? If I set up a campaign within LinkedIn and I'm targeting 50 companies at a top level, right? These are the 50 companies that sales gave us that are good prospects. I run a small test campaign in LinkedIn, right? And I find out that at that high level, that audience that engaged with our ads or at least got impressions, right? 80% of that is those customer service representatives or the salespeople that we're not looking to reach. So that leads me to take a very iterative approach with our LinkedIn advertising, because one by one, I can start peeling out these different members of this cohort who, again, high level, may have seemed good on paper, but at the end of the day, aren't the people that are ultimately converting. So with all of that, we had, I believe, three or four iterations of this campaign, peeling back all of those different elements and those factors, getting down to the chemist, getting down to the procurement specialist, tying that all together. And when you're talking about a company that has maybe a six to 12 month sales cycle in a very, what I would call unsexy industry like chemicals, being able to tie an actual completed offer all the way back up to a single LinkedIn ad, right? We probably run 16 different variations at a time so that we know what is working with messaging, what is working with creative. To me, getting that full funnel attribution as a result of that iterative approach really makes the campaign a success. Cool and great overview. And I wanna break it down into a lot of different pieces here. Uh, the first thing that I heard was that you start out with this large pool, you test yourself all the way down to the folks that seem to be exactly the bullseye for you and you can get there through testing. One of the experiences that we've had is that as you narrow your LinkedIn audience, the costs go up. And so obviously in theory, that's because they're more valuable and it's just a smaller audience. But it, I'm imagining that is the case for you, right? That the cost per whatever, however you do it. And I want to get to that. But so first, just confirm that the costs go up, right? Yeah, absolutely. And that is, I think, when it comes to this type of approach and this type of advertising, one of the biggest things that a client is quick to point out, well, our costs went up. Well, yes, you're targeting a much more refined pool than you know your larger group right and i think one thing that i would tell all of these clients is that if you're just looking at costs going up or down there's way more to the story and that context is extremely important for that cost yes your costs are going up but you're actually getting more leads for less in the long run because you are reaching more of the right people than wasting money on reaching people who would never convert in the first place. And so, yeah, it's a big emphasis on quality. I think this sort of next question is, you know, there are a lot of different options with, with LinkedIn. You know, there's form fills right there. There's, you know, and you can buy based on reach. You can buy it by click through, there's a lot of options. In this particular case, where were you, what were you optimizing for? So we were optimizing for landing page conversions, right? You mentioned the on LinkedIn form fill, and we did try that out for a while. I think the biggest problem we found with that is when a user clicks an ad on LinkedIn and they get a form right on LinkedIn, you are not able to really control the narrative, right? There's a lot more information and education that is needed in this type of conversion. And when you are not able to send users to a landing page and provide that information to them, they are very hard pressed to immediately give you their information on a form on LinkedIn. 
Okay, so we're optimizing for a landing page. I'm imagining you can test, you're also optimizing the landing page itself, right? Uh, and because, you know, the, let's face it, we all hate gated pages uh, and we ju just hate them. And, you know, you also see this sort of inverse relationship between the more you ask for, the less people fill out, you know, the less likely you capture people. How, just for a second, when we talk about optimizing form fills, how did you get it to sort of that sweet Goldilocks moment? Yeah, I think there is a lot of different ways to approach that and kind of piggybacking off of what Josh said. It's taking a look at the data, right? We tried a lot of different variations of messaging and that messaging relates specifically to a pain point, right? For these particular products in this campaign, a lot of different problems that these products solve. It was cost, it was availability, it was sourcing, variety of different things, right? And in combination with the creative and the messaging in the ad, creative messaging copy on the landing page, we came to a consensus that out of all the users who clicked on these ads and displayed some form of interest, their number one pain point was pricing. So once you can get to that golden nugget of information of that's our number one thing that our customers care about, that then becomes the focal point of all of your efforts, the landing page, the offer, and then going up, back up to the top with the creative and the messaging. And so that insight of pricing being their most important priority meant, okay, so the landing page is going to deliver on that pricing information or speak to that. Uh, then there's this question of what are we optimizing for? And this came up in a huddle the other day as well. It was landing page optimization because you can optimize for form fill, but that may not be the same as the person who ultimately buys, right? And, and right. so how, and, and you don't, if that's a 12 month, 12, 12 month sales cycle, you got to wait a long time to see if this particular type of person who filled out this form is in fact, ultimately a customer. How, yeah. how do you deal with that? I think one of the biggest challenges we faced with this particular client, and it is one that is far too common in organizations where there's a disconnect between marketing and sales, right? You can do everything you can possibly do as a marketer at the top level to generate the most qualified lead in the world. You can send that to sales and sales can close that lead and generate revenue. But if you have disparate systems along the way, or if you don't have the buy-in of sales to say, hey, you need to take this closed opportunity and enter all of the applicable information into our CRM so that our marketing team has access to it and can use it in the future, that is going to be one of the biggest challenges in getting that full funnel attribution. In this particular case, we identified that problem very early on and we're able to work with the marketing department at this client. And they very emphatically beat the drum for their sales team to say, hey, we're investing dollars into this initiative. We are going to be generating leads for you. You need to play ball and complete every step along the way and get all of that data back up to the top people who are using it. Got it. Okay, we had a question from the audience about uh, the pricing being an insight. Was there something during the, the buying process here that helped you deliver that insight or was that something that came out other ways? Yeah, so that was heavily determined by our testing with our ad variants. So I, I had mentioned that any given time we're running 10 to 16 different variants. Because we had four or five different criteria, pain points that these products solved, we had all of those run, right? So one ad heavily focused on price, one ad heavily focused on availability. And at the end of the day, the highest engagement with that creative and messaging came down to pricing. Right. And then ultimately I'm imagining, so the, the ads that got them engaged, which is number one, because if they don't engage with the ads, game over, was pricing. You go to the landing page that spoke to pricing, and then at some point down the road, you closed <laughs> those folks, right? Yeah. Uh, and and we're able to connect the dots. So there's a certain amount of patience involved in all of this, right? We did have another question about 
LinkedIn, and, and a lot of folks have experienced this, that LinkedIn is, because you can still target pretty well, it's more expensive. And often folks see that and say it's not as efficient as, say, uh, Facebook or Google's. And I'm just wondering if, you know, you are finding good results with LinkedIn. What What's your experience with that? I mean, uh, yeah, I 100 percent think that there is merit to the inefficacy of LinkedIn, right? This particular case study that we just discussed, we found a lot of success with it because we could not find success in these other channels. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, I have other clients who we've ran LinkedIn campaigns for that have produced abysmal results. And it didn't matter what we did from an optimization perspective. It didn't matter what we did from a targeting perspective. LinkedIn just was not the platform for that particular account. So I think overall, people can be very quick to dismiss LinkedIn because it is expensive. But I think that goes back to connecting all the dots, like you had said, right? If you can prove out that you spent XYZ dollars on LinkedIn and it generated 50% less efficiency in terms of your overall closing rate than comparable channels like Google ads and Facebook, then yes, absolutely don't invest any more time into LinkedIn. But if it's something that you haven't tried because you've heard that it is expensive and it doesn't get results, I'd say if possible, certainly dip your toes into the water and see what you can do with it. So I'm imagining, and again, if this is a new CMO and they're coming on, is that they're doing a side-by-side -side comparison test between these three platforms and are looking to see which one is sort of the fastest to an SQO, you know, sales qualified opportunity and, you know, which looks like pipeline. And, and so that is something that you could probably figure out in two to three months, right? In some cases, yes. And I do think it certainly comes down to your sales cycle but more importantly, it comes down to what stage of intent are your users at when they are engaging with that channel, right? If you were to say that LinkedIn had a higher cost, wasn't effective, and Google's delivering a much, much higher rate of conversion at a higher ROI, at ground level, sure, that makes sense. But the user who is potentially seeing an ad on LinkedIn could very well still be in the awareness stage versus someone on Google is at the baby stage ready to buy, right? So naturally, your Google ads are going to look like they are doing better, but that's because the users in that platform are at a different stage in the cycle. Right. Okay, let's bring Josh back. And we we started talking about, it's funny, we started talking about this, about SEO in general uh, before uh, folks came on. And there's a lot going on in 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 the world uh, with SEO. Uh, just, you know, I mean, I got hashtag OK Boomered on my question about audio, um, but let's just talk about that for a second. And, and Josh, do you have any uh, weigh in a little bit on how is audio search different from regular search? And is it something that that uh, folks in this audience need to be worried about, thinking about? It, I think it's less about the format of it being audio and more about how the data is being presented. So if you think about audio search, it's most commonly used with like a Google Home device or you know, some comparative thing. How do I make this recipe? What's the weather going to be like tomorrow? You get an answer. What you don't get what you would get with traditional online search are options that you can choose from by which to derive your own answer, right? So when you think about audio, it's less that people are going to be walking around talking into their Apple watches all the time. And, and to some extent people will, but if you look at how ChatGPT and how the uh, search generative experience or SGE from Google are starting to present answers in AI, they're answering them kind of in the same format that you would get from audio. It's here's the answer, not here are ways to get your answer. And you can see this in many different places. You can also see, do any search on Google right now. You see this, like people also ask thing pop up. It's got a bunch of different questions. You can drop them all down. It's Google training Bard and SGE for like, what answer do people like? What are we going to make the official thing? And so it's, I think it's less about 
people are just going to like, hey, who's the best B2B marketing platform that I should use? Like, that's probably not where things are going to go for necessarily our audiences, but it's more so if people are going to start adding levels of trust to ChatGPT and Bart to give them the answer versus expecting to do some research, that's where there is some concern. How do you become the official answer to those is the new SEO, and if I'm being well, and that's And let's, let's talk about that. So uh, I had seen and read that, you know, search traffic was down anywhere from five to 20%, uh, certainly initially when people went crazy over chat GPT, it is having an impact. Uh, mm -hmm. And I, I imagine, Mike, that you're seeing that as well. And in terms of even if in, in SEO, uh, that, uh, that your clients are noticing the impact. Yeah. Uh, in a roundabout way, I would say that the SERP is a mess right now. So not only if you're talking about organic specifically, are you competing with multiple ads, but you're competing with all of the features that Google has added over time. There's a whole craze right now of the zero click search result, right? So someone searches for something on Google, historically, if you showed up number one, they'd come to your site and they would get the answer. Now they can get that answer just on the SERP because Google is crawling and pulling that information and adding it into their own form or their own little knowledge base icon, right? So the competition and the necessity to be higher up on the SERP, I think, is at an all-time high right now. Totally agree. Yeah, no, I'm just thinking about my own uh, personal search at this time of the year, which is for a new, a, a perfect holiday punch. And I noticed that instead of giving me top 10, they did give, they gave me a recipe for a perfect holiday punch. I mean, yeah. that, and again, that's a very specific example of what's going on there. And so all of those sites, whether it was Gourmet Magazine or whatever, just lost traffic. So that's that's a big deal. And, and what are you advising your clients to do to fight this? Uh, because if in fact, your content is even content that might have been ranked in, you know, certainly first page content is no longer getting clicked. That's a mm -hmm. lot of site traffic and inbound that you lose, Josh. So what's a what's the answer here, or or what's a band aid? There, there's a a broad answer that's more strategic, and then a very tactical one. The broader one, I heard someone describe this the other day, and I really liked it. It used to be, we have to write content about all the keywords people might search about us. That was like the SEO content strategy is just cover them all page for each. And now it's, we have to cover all the different conversational angles that somebody could have about our product or our service. And so in many cases it's, it's similar, but it's more of like, Hey, if we were going to talk to someone about our software for 30 minutes, do we have content that answers all of their questions? Not that answers all the queries that they may have started with. So from a, a strategic standpoint, I think that's a really interesting thought process to go through. And then at the tactical level, the thing that is very acutely obvious is the people also ask answers, the citations that are given within the SGE experience, even though it's giving you an answer, it will tell you generally where it came from and answers we've gotten uh, from ChatGPT about where it sources its information. It all rolls back to having schema associated with pages in a meaningful way. So having a lot more content organized as Q&A content or FAQ content, or at least within a page saying this headline is a question, this paragraph is an answer starts to A, give you access to some of the stuff that's valuable in the SERP now, some of those zero-click experiences that Mike was talking about, uh, the more traditional ways to get more, more opportunities to be clicked on in search. But it also, all, all the data and research we've done alludes to the fact that these platforms, BARD, ChatGPT, the SGE experience, they're all going to start filtering content down to who has the schema that says they have an answer to a question, and then let's sift through that content to pick the right one. When we get analytics, certainly we'll know more, but if you're not using schema or considering it in the content that you're writing yesterday is the time to start. Yeah, I a hundred percent agree with that. And in terms of using the SERP itself and almost reverse engineering it, if you are in a highly competitive or, or your pages that you're trying to rank for are in a highly competitive niche, right? Google almost gives you the keys to the castle with the first 10 results, right? Anytime that I am doing keyword research, I am looking at results one through 10 and 99% of the time, 
each one of those results has some piece of information that the other nine don't have. So when you are talking about how to show up above all 10 of those other results, I kind of like to use their information against them. If I can aggregate all of that information that Google has deemed valuable in separate destinations and put that into one place, I have seen that strategy win almost every time. Interesting. Josh, we need to go back to what you mean by schema and just yep. be clear what that is. Of course. So I'm going to share in this chat the uh, maybe the world's ugliest website. This is like the official schema site that defines all the different um, code and the variables and the options. It's effectively a, a coding script, usually in, in JSON format, that uh, there are many different categories where schema could apply. Things like products, events, um, like if you search for a concert, you'll see results where like the event uh, dates and times and locations are listed beneath it's a, it's essentially a, um, it's not HTML or CSS, but it's an equivalent to tell Google and Bing and whomever that my content is in this format. I'm talking about a product. I'm talking about an event. I'm talking about a Q and a, I'm talking about an FAQ. And so there, there is significant ease of using chat GPT, for example, saying, Hey, here's my URL and all the content, please write the FAQ schema for me. And it, will, but it is a piece of code that has to be put uh, either onto the page or in the back end of the website. There are plugins for WordPress and others that allow you to just kind of paste it in. So it's slightly technical in nature, but it's effectively a coding language that say, this is my content, but this is what it's formatted. As. And power tip just today, you know, I imagine you're going to put your URL into chat GPT and you're going to say, tell me all the schemas I need for this website. And it's going to shoot something out. Is that right? Yeah, I, I would see the query is as simple as uh, you know, pasting the content of the URL and saying, write schema for this URL and you put that in there and it will give you a coding block in, in response. Love it. Power tip, folks. Uh, that, that's one. But it also just feels like it's FAQ on steroids now that really that the mindset for at least some of your content, if not a lot of your content. And We've been talking about this for a while in various conversations where if you don't answer the top 30 questions that your customers have <laughs> on your website and make it easy for them to find them, but that uh, that's a, something that every website should be able to do right now, which is answer the top 30 questions and 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 really and do that in a way that uh, in a way that is easily discoverable. And you know, I think that FAQs often don't do that. In general, but I also heard you sort of say, think about your content and make sure that a lot of it is just Q and A. I mean, because that's how this content is going to get digested. Now, there's a lot of question with SEO related to content in general, and you know, we did this uh, human versus generative AI. But Mike, you shared uh, in the pre-call that you've got at least one example where someone did 100% Gen AI content and they got number one ranking for it. Yeah, talk a little yeah. bit about that. It's pretty wild and it's understandable why content writers are maybe fearing for their employment given the evolution of chat GPT. And what I will say is that yes, generative AI and any content written by AI can be scary. And it certainly can be scary if you're an organization, if anyone heard about Sports Illustrated, they had an entire entire article written in AI. And I believe their CMO or, or someone comparable resigned, right? So people think it's something that you could just enter into chat GPT, you're going to get a piece of content and rank number one. That is not the case. In reality, you need a intelligent strategist who understands what the end user is looking for. Going back to the point of it's conversations, right? It's any conversation that could be had around a particular query, right? And AI can write that information, but it's up to the human to arrange that information in a way that makes sense to make sure that the page is formatted. I have a pretty standard SEO checklist that I use for any of the content that I write. FAQs, always one of them. Table of contents, always one of them. All of those little things that AI is not necessarily going to do from you, for you from scratch, that's where the human element comes in. And when you combine the two, the human and the AI, that is how you can rank number one with, at its core, AI content. Yeah, as, as you're talking, a power move number two out of this uh, call is go on ChatGPT and say, 
what are the top 30 questions that buyers in my industry are going to be asking me? Uh, yep. And then ask it to write the answers to those questions uh, and then see how, how your website does in answering them. And you could even be more specific if, if you dare, which is what are they, what are the top 30 questions that companies, you know, what are they asking your competitors? When, what might they be asking you, but you can sort of get this land. Uh, mm -hmm. I did. Here's one thing that I do want to share, which AI stands for average intelligence. And so be ready uh, to recognize that, that, that you're getting the average of the internet of all knowledge. Um, yeah. But I think that again, if we're th rethinking how we think about our website content and we're thinking about conversations and, and Q and A's, these tools can be unbelievably helpful when you're, when you're doing this. Um, so uh, one of the things that we haven't talked about at all, and I just want to sort of, since you're both at agencies and you can defend this case, and I know that a lot of uh, CMOs in our community, they're, they're, they've got buying teams and they do this stuff directly because certainly Google and uh, LinkedIn make it seem like it's easy. Uh, why should they hire an agency? <laughs> uh, and uh, Josh, why don't you go first on this one? It, I think for us, it's two major categories. It's uh, breadth and width of knowledge. Like you're going to get teams that have worked across 50, 60, or even hundreds of accounts, depending on how long they've been there. And so in many cases, there's a trigger that I've seen this before in a similar industry, similar client. Here's how we got out of it that time, or here's how we took advantage of it that time. You don't always get that with uh, with one person who just knows what they know when you're getting the mind share of multiple people in multiple industries. And then the, excuse me, the other is depth of knowledge. Uh, oftentimes when we've worked with in-house teams, they've got one person responsible for all of the ad platforms or one person responsible for all of demand gen. And you can only go so deep in that, right? The things are being released in each platform every day, every week. And then oftentimes to take advantage of them, you need a good media buyer, a good creative, someone technical that understands the APIs that are available to them. That's a very expensive thing to build in-house at a significant level of competency that a strong agency should have leaders in all those departments and know how those things should can and should work together and how to take advantage of them quickly. Mike, uh, any additional thoughts on, on that? Yeah, Josh had mentioned the depth of knowledge and the breadth of knowledge, right? I think for us specifically is the collective nature of that knowledge, right? Oftentimes we will have clients who come to us and say, hey, what are you seeing with other clients? who are engaged in a similar campaign like this, or what is or isn't working for other clients in this industry or in this category that you're working with. And having access to that information, having access to that data, oftentimes is extremely valuable to the original client that you're working with. And, you know, I think there's another part of this. One is, chances are, uh, you know, if you're doing it in-house, you, you may or may not be as efficient. You just don't know what you don't know. <laughs> and so there's that part of it. And two, you may be able to do it in-house, but it may just take you longer because you don't, you know, you're, you're sort of figuring it out as you, as you go along. Um, and these, you know, these companies out there that the agencies do it, this is their business. This is what they do. So in theory, uh, at least they, they would be uh, ultimately more it'd be more cost effective for you to do it that way. So, all right. So we're talking about expertise and, and cost effectiveness. Got it. So, all right. Let's start with Mike. Please give two tips for CMOs on how they can optimize their digital media spending. Absolutely. So tip number one, pretty short and simple. Anywhere, any chance you can. One-to-one -one messaging, right? Starting at the top level, making sure that your ad copy is aligned as much as possible to the user's intent or the user's pain point. After that, making sure the destination that they are going to after clicking an ad or engaging with your brand 100% matches the ad and the creative that you promise them. Taking it down the line, right? Making sure that your offer on that landing page and the subsequent process after that is 100% aligned with that initial intent, right? Understanding your user. Second part is somewhat of a segue from that. I would say 
do not be afraid to go against the grain when it comes to recommendations from any of the various platforms that you might be putting media buys on. Far too often, people are quick to accept a Google recommendation because they think, because Google says it, it's going to make them more money. At the end of the day, Google's trying to make themselves more money, right? And despite what they may say, nobody knows your user better than you. So if Google's telling you something that doesn't align with your user's intent, don't listen to it just because you think you have to. Got it. Okay. So I, what I really was, what I just want to emphasize and put a punctuation point on is you got, you've, you've narrowed your target because you know, these are the folks that look like your past buyers. You've really done a great job of targeting the thing, but where I often see it fall apart is that you haven't brought it all the way through. And if you're doing one-on-one -on -one messaging, you know, here's the other thing is you can use these tools, these generative AI tools to um, both look at your landing page and see if they're optimized, but they can also help you generate them. So uh, this one-on-one -on -one, uh, notion is really powerful. So thank you for that, Mike. Okay, Josh, your turn. Two tips for CMOs on how they could optimize their digital media spending right now. First one is to take the entire digital media program that you have and measure it from traffic and cost all the way through to revenue. If you don't have that reporting set up or capable, make it so. Because the biggest leverage point we've seen for the last 18 months is the gap between either lead and qualified lead or MQL and SQL. That drop-off percentage is the single biggest opportunity that you have, more so than extra volume at the top, more so than ACB. Increasing that qualification is going to make everything easier and more valuable. And the second one, which can often be uncomfortable, is shifting the measurement and holding accountable both to the teams, the platforms, and the programs that you're running to the cost per qualified thing, the SQL, the qualified lead. There's too often that it's like, yay, we got all the MQLs at the top. It's awesome. But then, you know, one sale and then it, everyone's generally upset about it. Shift everything from what the platforms look at to what you report on to what your team reports back to you down a step in the funnel and some of that MQL to SQL qualification challenge will solve itself. And I, I think that's so important. We talk about this in huddles all the time. I mean, some folks are not even, sh are they may be tracking MQLs, but they're definitely not sharing them with anybody because it simply is, it's, it's a, a false sense of comfort. And what I really appreciate what you just said, Josh, was we're going to, we're going to measure everything on SQOs or or at least uh, in or SQLs, whatever you want to call them, because that is pipeline. And that is what the organization is asking from uh, certainly the CMOs in our community. OK, um, before we wrap up, we have one last second question, which is how critical are response times for the leads you generate and what is a good metric to strive for? The this is one of those where more is always better, faster is always better. I saw a data point yesterday. If you can reply to a lead in under three minutes, you have a 700% increased chance, not only in getting them on the phone, but moving them to the next step. Certainly that's not always possible with the size of teams, but if you can be under 30 minutes, that is significantly better than an hour or God forbid next day or next week. All right, faster, the better. Uh, and I think all the studies prove that. All right. Well, thank you, Josh Mushkin, Web Mechanics, and Mike Yulensky from ThunderTech for your insights today. And thank you for being in the CMO Huddle's Preferred Partner Program. You both rock. Had a blast.